Good afternoon. Up until this year, I thought I knew my health equity journey. I always attributed my journey to external forces, but from this past year, learning from all of you, others, and from our time in Rwanda, where the phrase, remember, unite, and renew, has stayed with me. I have realized that my health equity story really started with my family and my upbringing. My story starts with this, a bike horn. Usually, when my sister and I heard this sound, <laughs> while we were playing outside or uh, playing downstairs, we quickly became excited because we knew that it was time for dinner. <laughs> you might be wondering, why didn't my mother just yell out, dinner is ready? <laughs> well, both of my parents are deaf, and like many other deaf people, they are not mute. My mom can use her voice, but she chooses not to. And since she's a notorious hoarder, she didn't throw this out when we outgrew it and repurposed it as a dinner bell. This horn and other memories of my childhood, like how my friends loved to come over and ring our doorbell because all the lights in the house would flicker to let my parents know that someone was at the door. This was all normal to me. Now looking back, we repurposed things and had devices to create an environment where my parents and other deaf individuals could interact with the he surrounding hearing world. To be honest, I never thought much about the dynamics of being raised by deaf parents. I accepted that this was just life. I carried that same acceptance whenever I mentioned to people that my parents are deaf. Often, I get a sympathetic look and sometimes an apology, to which I would usually brush off and try to make them feel less upset about my upbringing. Where was this sympathy coming from? I just met you and you're already apologizing to me? I am reminded of a story uh, a deaf friend of mine told me recently. She went to an audiologist to get an audiogram, a hearing test for some paperwork to prove that she is deaf. At the end of the testing, the audiologist told my friend, I'm sorry, but you are completely deaf. My friend was speechless, not by the news. She was born deaf, but why was this person apologizing? That audiologist and others are well-intentioned, but there is an unintended consequence. Their reaction suggests that something is wrong with being deaf. Subconsciously, their sympathy is rooted in a deeper pathology of autism, which is the discrimination or prejudice based on a person's ability or lack of ability to hear. On some level, this is understandable. Most hearing people have never interacted with a deaf person. And if you can't communicate through sign language, you wouldn't know that deaf people have a vibrant and culturally rich community. However, autism is pervasive in our society and deaf, deaf people are looked down upon, which is even true of my relatives. My father, who became deaf at a young age and had met my mother through connection from the Hong Kong School for the Deaf, my, my grandfather, who I respect and admire, as he was a selfless, active leader in the Chinese-American community, was a victim of these negative views. And he held on to an old-fashioned belief that my father would be better off with a hearing spouse. He didn't approve of my parents' decision to marry and chose not to attend their wedding. I can't imagine what the, the impact this had on my parents. And while the story was always that my grandfather was traveling for work, in reality, the issue was autism. For most of my life, I didn't fully recognize the impact of autism on my family with the larger hearing world until a few years ago. A major medical journal had a review article on cochlear implants, devices that potentially can help people hear. The author wrote, deafness impairs quality of life by relentlessly dismantling the machinery of human communication. When I read this, I was shocked. This was not my reality, nor my parents. They taught me how to communicate, while it may not have been the predominantly accepted form of verbal communication, my first word was signed, not spoken, which was milk. I most likely would not be here, standing in front of you today as a family medicine physician, if society had written my parents off because they are both deaf and immigrants. They both moved here from Hong Kong, and while it was difficult not knowing English or ASL, American Sign Language, they had equitable systems in place to help them. While my father did not have a high school diploma, he was able to attend Gallaudet University, at that time the only college for the deaf, with full financial support and worked hard to complete the prerequisites and graduate with a college degree. My mother had support to learn English and engage in job, job training programs. Both learned ASL through self-study and then taught my sister and me. Sometimes my mother receives compliments that we are fluent in ASL, to which my mother responds, of course they know how to sign. How else could we communicate? Unfortunately, this does not hold true for many in the deaf community. 90% of deaf children are raised by hearing parents 
And for a variety of reasons, family members don't learn sign language. This is true of my father's parents and two siblings. They never learned how to communicate with him in sign. I remember growing up with my grandfather and my father having to pass a piece of paper back and forth to have a conversation. You can imagine how frustrating it must be to have to write down your thoughts, emotions, and feelings as your only mode of communication with a loved one. While it is difficult to learn a new language, it is a travesty that many deaf children are never able to communicate with their family members in their primary language. You may be wondering, how many people use ASL as their primary language? We actually don't know. Estimates range from 100,000 to 1 million. The US collects data on language through the Census Bureau. And in the survey that, uh, that they use to capture non-English languages, they focus on uh, capturing non-English languages. But the questions are not focused on spoken language, and they're not designed to identify ASL as a primary language. So what ends up happening is that the Census Bureau lumps ASL signers among those who speak English. How can we design and implement visually appropriate linguistic services and programs if we are not accurately capturing the number of deaf individuals? My parents were fortunate to have services that supported their language and educational needs, which created an environment where they thrived. For my parents, who in contrast to the author's viewpoint on deafness, they had a great quality of life. This came to an abrupt end when my father was diagnosed with metastatic stomach cancer. This was right before the uh, creation of the ADA, uh, the American with Disabilities Act, a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities and requires that healthcare systems provide appropriate interpretation services for the deaf, something that my father did not have. He had many healthcare challenges before his death, but there was a small memorable challenge, which was a television. As you know, there's not much to do while you're lying there on a hospital bed. And like everyone else, my dad wanted to watch TV. But the problem was the TV wasn't closed captioned. You're probably not used to closed captioning, but I grew up with it. I can't watch TV to this day without it. I'm actually known amongst my friends as the guy who comes over, turns out the captions, and then just leaves. <laughs> and you know, because then the caption menu is usually buried, which is why we're all laughing, because we know it takes forever to find that to turn it off. And so they're usually calling and texting me, and hey, how do I turn off the captions? But back then, uh, we had to bring our own TV. Now, this is back in the late 80s. So if you remember, the TVs back then were like these huge, bulky things with like the dials and the antennas, nothing like the thin TVs that we have now. So I remember having watched some people take this heavy TV from our house to the hospital room because all my dad wanted to do was watch TV in the hospital like everyone else. Looking back, it should, have been, it should not have been our responsibility to meet the needs of my father. It was the hospital's responsibility. Health systems back then, and even to today, are not fully equipped to meet the needs of the deaf community. If we view deafness as an impairment that destroys quality of life, then we are actually causing that poorer quality of life. A few years ago, I started a clinic for the deaf community, community to address communication and cultural barriers, where patients can come and able to communicate in their primary language directly with their healthcare provider. This experience is unique and has resulted in better preventative healthcare services, such as higher immunization rates and higher routine cancer screenings when compared to non-signing medical providers. Through this fellowship, I'm beginning to realize the full potential of this health equity work. I have learned from faculty and from all of you how to create a more equitable healthcare system for the deaf community. There is now a genera generation of deaf children where rights are protected, whose rights are protected to an equitable learning and work environment. Health disparities in the deaf community can be alleviated, alleviated by having more deaf healthcare workers. We should be recruiting and supporting these students to enter the healthcare workforce. I am now working with colleagues at Gallaudet University to build a healthcare pipeline for deaf students. We recently had our first session with 10 undergraduate students, which led to my first shadowing experience with a student who's interested in becoming a physician's assistant or a PA in rural Texas. While we all cannot learn ASL, as some of you know, it is challenging. We can push for health equity by advocate, advocating for the following. Supporting ASL language acquisition for all family members of deaf individuals. Essential information to be available in ASL. ASL to be counted as a primary language, language amongst the other non-English spoken languages. All media to be closed captioning and to have open captioning. More support and funding for interpreting services and increased access to communication technology such as video phones. Overall, we can advocate for the inclusion of the deaf community into mainstream society. To end, I want to highlight something that I spoke about earlier from our trip to Rwanda. A country that has suffered, but from that suffering, has learned and created a society focused on equity, valuing all people regardless of differences.
At the Kigali Genocide Museum, there were these huge banners with a drawing of a flame and with the word Kwebuka, which means to remember. Kwebuka calls, us, calls on the world to stand against genocide in three key ways. To remember, honoring the memory of those who died, offering support to those who survived. To unite, Rwanda shows that reconciliation through sh shared human values is possible. They ask the world to do the same. To renew, as they build Rwanda anew, they are humbled to share their experiences and learn from others. <coughs> Let's create a better world together. I want us to remember what brings us here today, honoring your stories, my parents' stories, and my story of this bicycle horn. As they unite us through shared values of equity, and that through our experiences together and learning from each other, we are creating an equitable world that breaks down the barriers of autism, structural racism, classism, sexism, homophobism, and all the other oppressive isms. And together, we can promote health equity for all. Thank you.